We experience the changed heart when we're genuinely converted by the grace of God. When we come to that place where we have that power encounter with the living Christ. But it's possible, and not only possible, but it's very common, even after conversion, to still have a troubled heart. One of the reasons is we really have never understood what consecration means, never understood what the Lordship of Christ involves. And especially people that have been converted as children, they go along in life, and their understanding of who Jesus is, that he is Lord and Master and Boss, then they come to the point in their life where they have to make another decision. Are they going to yield their lives to him or not? And the scriptures in Proverbs 23, verse 26, says, my son, give me your heart and let your eyes keep my way. In other words, God says, the heart that's been converted, that new heart, you still have some control over that. But I want you to give it to me, your, your new heart. Give it to me and allow me to direct it and to direct your life. Consecration is really handing our new heart over to God with no strings attached, saying, you are Lord, and I want you to be in total control of my life, every facet of it. That he's the creator, he's the controller, he's the CEO, he's the commander in chief. And I begin to understand that in a new way. And I say, yes, Lord, I want to present my life to you. So consecration, when we use that word, it's acknowledging and responding to the Lordship of Christ. People know him as Savior, and sometimes when they come to know Christ, they come to know him as Savior and Lord. They understand the full package. But sometimes that understanding is pretty limited. All they know is that Jesus loves me, he died for me, I believe it, I need a Savior, I'm drawn to him, and I receive him as my savior. Now as years go by and their understanding is increased, they understand who he is. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. And consecration is acknowledging that and responding to that. Colossians 1.18 says, so that in everything he might have the preeminence. They want to bring their whole life under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's consecration. But it's a process. It's a process of changing from a self-centered life to a Christ-centered life. And that is a process. But more and more, I want to bring my life, every facet of it, under his control, under his lordship. And the Holy Spirit is always revealing another unguarded, unexamined area of our lives. Say, so what about this? I say, yes, Lord, I want to put that under your lordship. I want to consecrate that part of my life to you. It's an act of willing surrender. He doesn't force any of us. He said, my son, give me your heart. He doesn't demand it. He encourages us to do that. The clearest verse that I know in the Bible about consecration is Romans 12, 1 and 2. And I, and I would really encourage you to write that out on the blackboard, write it on a three by five card, do whatever you need to do, memorize Romans 12, one and two. Those are verses after he's had 11 chapters in the book of Romans explaining, especially in the first five chapters, what it means to be converted and how to live the Christian life and his plan for Israel. And he's done all of that. Then he comes to Romans 12. He says, therefore, I urge you, I plead with you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God, which is your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to this world any longer. Be transformed by the renewing of your minds, which is part of your heart. 
why that you might prove what's the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So let's talk about what it means to present. Let's unpack that verse a little bit. As I said, there is a moment of consecration. I believe it might be at a camp, it might be at a church service. You're a believer, you're sitting there, and you have a new understanding of Jesus. Or maybe the call from the preacher or teacher says, you're a Christian, but will you yield your life, submit your life to the Lord, and you do that. That's a commitment. But then there's the outworking of that. And Romans 12 helps us. But let's break it down and uh, unpack that a little bit. First of all, it's a voluntary act. He said, I urge you, brothers. I don't command you. I urge you. I beg you. I plead with you. And when you urge somebody or when you plead with them, you're going for the heart, aren't you? You want their heart. I plead with you. And that's what he says, in the mercies of God, because of all that God has done for us. He says, I beg you, isn't the least you can do is say, Lord, I give my life back to you. I can, con even as a believer, I can continue to call my own shots and own direction. But when I come to a place where believing that God knows far better than I do how to direct my life, He's the Lord. He's bought me with a price. My life belongs to him. And now he says, I urge you, present your bodies. And when he says your bodies, that represents all that you are and all that you have. But he says, offer it, present. That's an act of the will again. Deciding who's going to be number one in your life. And when he says, your bodies, that's a total act. Your body stands for everything you are and have your possessions, your gifts, your talents. It's all of me. Lord, it's all I've got. But it belongs to you, and I recognize that. And I give it to you. I present it to you, such as it is. That is a sacrificial act. As a living sacrifice, it costs. Death to your own plans, to your own wishes, to the uh, things that you I want to do, but when you do that, that sacrificial act, die to your own plans and dreams, you realize that God has dreams and plans for your life that are far better than you could have ever possibly imagined. Then he said, this is a pleasing act to God. Why is God pleased when you do this? So now I can say, I've got you, and I can make you do what I want? No. You know why God is pleased? Because when you surrender that way, when you consecrate your life, when you say, no strings attached, I present my life to you, that breaks up a log jam in your heart that blocks God. Now God, the Spirit, is even freer to work through you to give you that glorious, fulfilled life that he has planned for you. Because it says that you might prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God? Now, if you really believe that, that's not only good as far as I'm concerned, but as far as God's concerned. God's plan for your life is good. It's acceptable to him, but it's acceptable to you. You say, yeah, this is, this is right. It's good and acceptable and it's perfect. You say, I couldn't have orchestrated my life any better. And I know when I've consecrated my life to the Lord, I look back on my life. Yes, I've made mistakes. Yes, I've failed and all the rest. But I have consecrated my life to the Lord. I've crawled off the altar a few times. But basically, God knows my heart that I've said, you have saved me. You have purchased me by the blood of your son, Jesus. And Lord, at 19 years of age, I gave my life to you. I presented my body to you, and I said, Lord, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll be what you want me to be. My life is yours. There are times I've taken it back. It's a moment in time which you made it, a crisis experience. But there is a process. And again and again, I've had to come back and crawl back on the altar and say, Lord, 
I am yours. I mean that. And even in spite of the times that I've crawled off the altar and failed, God has orchestrated my life. And here I am, been married almost 53 years this summer. And I look back on my life and I say, I could not have written the script any better. A God has led. His will is really good. It's really acceptable. It's perfect. The only things I would change are my own failures, but God's grace, as we'll talk about, wipes those clean too. So that's the two key components if you want to have a changed heart. And you do, because we need it. Above all else, the world is Jesus. People need a new heart. How does it happen? Through conversion. We've talked about that. Those three things come. Secondly, if you have been converted, and you know that, and you have that certainty and that assurance, but there's still something really missing, and you still just don't feel that satisfaction, that joy, that sense of peace that you want, that untroubled heart that we talk about, I would encourage you to look at that next step. Have I ever really consecrated my life to him? Have I ever offered my life to him with no strings attached? Recognize that he is Lord. And that concept has really dawned on me that he is the master. And say, Lord, the best that I know how, with no reservations, I'm yours. I'm your child. I want to be your servant. I want you to be my master. I'm yours. Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. But here's some questions for you. What does the phrase to ask Jesus into your heart really mean to you? And then ask yourself the further question, have I really invited Jesus into my heart? Do you understand what that means? Secondly, what changes have I experienced since I have asked Jesus into my heart? What notable changes? Can I, can I point to any changes that have happened? Do I really understand now that the love of God has been poured, apart, uh, poured out in my heart? Have I experienced that? Do I have the witness of God's Spirit in my heart? The Holy Spirit residing there saying, yes, you belong to me. Ask yourself, what changes? Three, do I have that absolute assurance that Jesus resides in my heart? I hear people say sometimes, I hope so. I think so. I'm not sure. God wants you to be sure. He wants that to be a subtle issue. And I ask you, do you have the assurance that you've received a new heart from him and that the living Christ resides within you? Then list any areas of your life that you feel that you have not consecrated to the Lord. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's your career. Maybe it's your finances. I don't know. But just try to think through what areas of my life am I still hanging on to and I'm controlling and I want to let go and I want him to control? This will make a huge difference to you if you come to that point in your life. It doesn't solve all your problems. But this again is foundational. I'm laying the groundwork here because we're not going to be able to move on through the rest of it, we're going to really get to the uh, details of the journey to the untroubled heart now. But this is foundational. 